initiatives that uh, work in the emerging news ecosystem. We talk about our projects and reward innovations for journalism and a lot of things like that. And our panel today is really focused upon uh, one of the things that we have seen emerging in the ecosystem really in the last 18 months to two years is an enormous amount of collaboration um, that is happening in an entirely different line except from the from a competition that we used to see um, as traditional kind of news organizations. I'm going to um, run very quickly through six slides that will give you a broad overview um, of what the types that we're seeing. We're certainly seeing collaboration in terms of content syndication. People are actually paying other news organizations to fund stories. So you have things like the Chicago News Co-op and the Bay Citizen uh, having a deal with the New York Times to get paid a monthly fee uh, to fill four pages of the New York Times with content. And then you see something like the Voice of San Diego, which has a deal with the NBC affiliate uh, to do a, a thing called Fact Check, uh, which are actually fact-checking government accountability information. They're getting paid for that. The other thing is straight content sharing or swapping. Um, and what we're seeing there is not so much pay always, although in some cases, California Watch is um, sharing with media all of the same, Te Texas Tribune is sharing media uh, stories it does all over the state, and ProPublica is, is in a reach of very broad content collaborations with every one. Um, and even giving tutorials on how other news organizations can use their data. Statewide investigative projects are now broadly collaborative. You see things like Wisconsin Watch, you see things like um, Oklahoma Watch, uh, you see things like uh, iNews in Denver, Colorado, most of them are focused on state government reporting, but their information is broadly available um, to other um, news entities in the state. And then you see what I call network journalism collaboratives. JLab is funded for uh, uh, projects that incentivize uh, independent news startups and public media entities in the news ecosystem to collaborate with other uh, news producing organizations. Often a bigger news organization is at the hub. So you've got the Seattle Times now partnering with, they've grown their partnership from five to 39 partners. Um, and you've got things like um, Tucson Citizen, which has a partnership among sports bloggers to cover the Arizona Wildcats been very successful. We've got partnerships just emerging in February um, where the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette is really trying to aggregate bloggers around the whole environmental controversies around Marcellus Shale. So that's another kind of collaboration that we are beginning to see. And then you see audience collaborations. David's going to talk more about this. Um, Public Insight Network, ProPublica, and certainly Spot Us. Um, university collaborations Tom will talk about. Everything from what the New York Times is doing with NYU and East Village um, to what uh, the investigative reporting workshop is doing with Frontline at American University. Tom will tell you more. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying um, we wondered if any news consumers in these areas noticed the collaboration. And we just fielded a uh, <coughs> survey in March in Seattle um, because their collaboration had absolutely no promotion, OK? So we stuck at the monitor and said, did anybody notice? And what we got back was really fascinating. There are 996 responses to this online survey. 84% said they value the partnership for the community journalism. 78 loved it for making it easier to connect to news sites. 52% um, said it improved their uh, opinion of the Seattle Times. Um, and 324 people wrote long paragraphs saying how much they liked it. So I think we're beginning to see um, that people are paying more attention than anybody noticed. So with that, um, one of our um, editors at the Seattle Times says, we might not be seeing a traffic game, but it definitely bolsters our brand. Um, so something to think about. So um, there you see our new logo. With that, let me introduce the panel, now that they're all here. Um, we have um, Susan Murdoch, who is the founder of Oakland Local, uh, a startup that actually received its JLab New Voices grant a couple of years ago, but has done many more things on its own since then. She has a background um, uh, with uh, many traditional uh, digital news entities. David Cohn um, is the founder and Night News Challenge winner of Spot.us, which is a crowdfunding initiative, and he's also a fellow at the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. 
Tom Fiedler is a former uh, editor of the Miami Herald, now head of the uh, journalism school at Boston University, which now runs a lot of student-run news initiatives. And Lisa Williams is the founder of placeblogger.com. Uh, um, she's also a fellow of the MIT Media Lab um, and a former Night News Challenge winner. You can read more about their bios um, in the packet. Um, I thought I, have you got enough to be your breath caught uh, now to uh, start? Susan, why don't you start and we'll just go down the table from, from there. You have uh, something you want me to call it? Um, I'd like to turn on Open Local. And um, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Jan to show the um, work we did about Oscar Grant. I don't know how many of you have seen Oakland Local or know much about Oakland, California, but it's an incredibly diverse city where people speak 170 different languages. And a lot of the mainstream media was very siloed and not really covering a lot of the important <coughs> issues and very much not reflecting the voices of the community. So Juan Booth, Amy Garrett, and I decided to start a site and the catalyst was the murder of a young man named Oscar Grant, who was shot on a BART platform by a BART officer, um, lying face down and died. And this caused a huge uproar in Oakland. And one of the things that we did from the beginning is collaborate very closely with David Cohn. If you could go on the top, Jan, and just do tags, type into the URL tags, then slash Oscar-Grant. Um, we really wanted to cover this story. and. Uh, Oakland Local, while it has a very high quality level of content, um, I actually work another job. We don't really have very much of an operating budget yet. We're just 18 months old. So we knew that there was no way that we were going to, um, uh, actually, Jan, I want you to do it on Oakland Local. Yeah, Okay, that's great, thank you. All right, so this is our Drupal index page that shows some of the like, you know, 75 to 300 stories we filed about Oscar Grant and the trial since the murder happened. But what we did was we collaborated with Spot Us and we raised $4,000 to fund a local reporter in Los Angeles who could go to the trial and file quality independent stories about the trial. And this was an incredibly transformational thing for Oakland Local to do. We collaborated with New America Media, we collaborated with the Black Hour and with a number of other smaller entities around the Bay Area and we distributed these stories so that they went to literally dozens of places. Um, they also became an authoritative stamp for, um, for, for mainstream media. So one story we ran on the opening of a trial uh, got read 17,000 times because of the play that it got in um, Yahoo News. So, you know, when we talk about collaborating and working together, this was a great example of how a site with very little money, I think the original amount we put up to cover our share of the Spot Us uh, stories for this project was about $250. And we got the other partners, like New American Media, each put up $250. Spot Us was fantastic, put up money. The Place Blogger Angel Fund contributed <coughs> money. Lots of people gave $5, $10, $20. And we ended up doing really exemplary coverage that we're all incredibly proud of. And I think that's very much you know, what's made Oakland Local work is the spirit of partnership and collaboration. We maintain a newsroom, we maintain an editorial budget, but a third of our content actually comes in over the transom from community contributors and partners. And we're really open to taking not only reflections that people have and publishing them. A lot of the Oscar Grant coverage are not only news stories, but people talking about how they felt or what they experienced, which is something the traditional media doesn't do. <coughs> but we also work with people, David being a great example, <coughs> to develop new story ideas. <coughs> You know, I'll take questions, a few questions after each of you, but then more questions at the end. Does anybody else, did anybody have questions about how this runs? Is that the only story you've done that like this? Um, again, I'm going to not take your thunder away, but um, we spent about $700 to get um, almost $8,000 worth of support via Spot Us. We're really huge on crowdsourcing. We got a grant from the GW Williams Institute for Innovative Journalism. We collaborated with them. 
to do a series on youth sex trafficking, which was a really in-depth investigative report. And now, eight months later, this is broken open as a huge community issue in Oakland, but we were really the first people to do any authoritative coverage. The paper stopped covering this issue as they uh, got rid of their reporters, including our reporter who kept covering it for us. So we're very much about partnership and collaboration. The place that we draw a very careful line is that we don't do advocacy, and we're very much about transparency. So we've just recently run stories uh, from partners like Bay Localized who have a benefit. You know, we'll be very scrupulous about disclosing whether this is an advertising partner or whether this is a partner, and really make a distinction between what, what we call community voices collaboration. We're really, we're really collaborating with the community member. And then what's actually reporting, we're following society professional journalist standards. We make our partners also follow those standards. We want to be really clear contextually about what kind of collaborations we're having. And just to say one more kind of collaboration that's very meaningful to us, we do more and more youth collaborations. And Quan Booth, who's also here from Oakland Local, has really taken a great lead in working with groups like Youth Radio and Youth Uprising and Urban Roots. And a lot of the uh, youth, and youth is 18 to 25 in Oakland, people who are really learning different kinds of creative skills, often out of funding that's coming out of uh, anti-gang prevention. And um, a lot of people are doing wonderful work. It's not necessarily that well packaged for the media. So we work a lot with them to take their work and put it in formats that make it more accessible <coughs> to a broader audience, because we may know more about you know, uh, SEO or how to really optimize for the web. Questions? Let's move on to David. David, would you prefer to come up here and talk? Um, you, you prefer me to? I can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll hang in. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, and if you could just pull up Sawdust, that's probably fine. Um, so uh, my name is David Cohn, and I run a site called Spot Us. And uh, the quick explanation is that we fundraise for independent journalists. Uh, you'll be able to see it in a little bit. Um, what I typically, sort of my, my line on collaboration, I say, is that uh, content is king, uh, but collaboration is queen. So, so content is, is king, and, and I think always will be, and, and in the end is still the most important sort of thing, right? If, if you lose that, you lose the game, so to speak. Uh, but you know, s similar to in chess, uh, the queen is, is really the most powerful piece and can traverse from one side of the board to the other. Uh, and I think collaboration uh, in, in news operations is, is very similar. You can do more with it, um, although in the end it has to be in protection of or you know to sort of serve the king um, that that content, right? Um, and it's interesting too if you look at the the way that that this has changed because uh, again even just a few years ago. Uh, I think news organizations really saw their competition as the other, right? They were in competition with each other. Um, uh, two newspaper towns, that's who they were competing with in terms of uh, attention. Um, and, and now on the web, I think it's actually very different. Um, they're in competition, they, they have similar uh, competitors. They're more in competition with uh, Facebook, Twitter, or uh, cute videos of cats. Um, and you know, I'm guilty of those of watching those cute videos of cats. But um, the the point being is that uh, you know, news organizations uh, can achieve more by working together um, <coughs> to sort of compete against the attention uh, of of those cats. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about, I guess, the way Spot Us works uh, real quick, which is to say that uh, another really important thing is not just uh, news organizations collaborating with each other, but news organizations uh, or news entities collaborating <coughs> with the public. Um, and I think the, the initial way that we, we think of that now is sort of uh, post the story, right? We, the, everything happens, and then we put the story up, and then the public is invited to comment on it. And I think that's a really good start, but we're sort of working backwards from there, right? We sort of say, okay, here's the story. You can, you can collaborate by telling us what you think of it. And on Spot Us, what we do is we put up story ideas from different organizations. We're, we're, Spot Us is not a news an editorial force, we're like a platform for other editorial forces like Oakland Local, Local. Um, and they put up their story ideas and say, you know, here's the story we want to do. We want to uh, do a story about this uh, issue that's going on in Florida about saving Florida force. I think that one only needs $17 left to go, right? Um, and the public can actually enable that to happen, right? People can say, uh, this story is important to me, that story isn't, I'm going to give my dollars to this story. So they're literally voting for it, uh, but not just voting for it up or down, they're actually enabling it to happen by either donating, they, someone can click fund the story and donate their own money, or they can click pre-credits, they'll take a uh, survey from one of our fine sponsors. 
Um, and then their account will earn $5, which then they can allocate towards the store of their choice. So if any of you do have computers, you can, you're free to stop paying attention to me, click your free credit. Um, <laughs> um, but, but so that's the way it works. And, um, and I think that that's another type, and what we're trying to do is start uh, the, the sort of process of collaborating with the public from the very beginning. Stories won't be able to happen unless the public sort of takes ownership and, and gets involved. Um, from there, the next sort of step, and this is in, in truth something that Spotus does not do very, very well, but other organizations do, is the process of reporting itself the public can get involved in, right? And I think there are a lot of different um, sites out there that do what I would call um, distributed reporting. Some people call it citizen journalism. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, but it's basically this idea of taking the process of reporting, right? And reporting is this process of collecting information, filtering information, and then distributing the information taking that process and inviting people of the public to get involved with it. Uh, and, I, and, and that can happen uh, sort of by inviting one person to sort of tackle one thing, or um, you know, a, a, another way to describe it is crowdsourcing, where you distribute the workload, right? Um, a, a, a good example of that is um, uh, what, the, what the, I think it was The Guardian did uh, not too long ago, where they got a bunch of documents um, related to uh, spending uh, in, the, in the parliament and, you know, you know, cut up into a thousand pages basically, and a thousand different people all looked at one page each, right? Mm -hmm. So distributing the workload, and that's another type of thing. Um, another uh, final example is uh, an organization that I uh, am on the board for, full disclosure, uh, called News Trust. Uh, it's, a, it's a nonprofit, and what they're sort of a media literacy tool, and they invite members of the public to look at the, the stories that are produced and really look at them critically. And sort of both them up or down, but not just straight up or down, but up or down on different criteria of, of journalistic criteria. Is it well sourced? Is it well written? Is there any bias, et cetera? And I think that's another thing where the public can really take ownership um, and collaborate with news organizations to sort of provide that, that feedback that says, here's what you're doing right, here's what you're doing wrong, here's what you should cover, here's what you shouldn't cover. That's sort of what Spot Us does. Um, and, and here's me helping you with a little bit of my time as opposed to money. Um, on what, what can happen. Um, the last thing I want to say, or I guess the last two things, one is is um, I think the majority of my career, I say, has been uh, towards pushing boundaries of transparency and participation in the process of journalism. And I really think those are two sides of the same coin, right? You cannot have collaboration unless you're more transparent, right? Because how can you ask people to help if you don't tell them what you're, what, what you're asking for help with? Um, and so I think, you know, when we talk about collaboration, we, we often ignore, but have to really put emphasis on uh, transparency and, and, and pushing the boundaries of transparency in how journalism is done. Again, both between different organizations, if they want to collaborate with each other, they need to be transparent with each other, and the public. We need to be more transparent with the public about how they can get involved. And when you say transparency, do you mean in terms of finances? Do you mean in terms of point of view? Do you mean? A, a little bit of everything. I mean, uh, in fact, on Spot Us is a good example. Um, this is not. This is transparency both in terms of finances. You can see where every dollar comes from, but also transparency in you're saying what you're going to do the story on, right? You're sort of laying it out ahead of time. And I'd say that there are certain stories that this doesn't work for, right? If you're investigating the mafia, maybe you don't want to put that up on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, again, traditionally, 20, 30 years ago, if you had a really good story, you hoarded that. You held that as close to the chest. You wouldn't tell anybody, right? Because you don't want the competition to know. Um, but you know what I really try and, and push is you know you can actually uh, still keep that scoop mentality, um, but allow the public to know about it, right? Because in some respects, by putting it up on on Spot Us, you've already scooped it, right? You've, you've already elbowed out and said I'm I'm owning the story, but you're invited to come help. Me. So it's that kind of sense of transparency. Do you care if some of these stories have an advocacy point of view? Does it matter for Spot Us? Um, on Spot Us, it doesn't matter as long as there, there's a disclosure about it. We have had stories from people that come from a position of advocacy, um, and as long as they disclose that so that people can see it, then, then we're fine with it. What I say is um, that we're not an advocacy organization. Um, that said, we don't, we're not afraid of, of advocacy. And does anyone ever want to pitch a story that made you squirm? Um, does anybody pitch a story that made you squirm? There have been stories that I myself personally did not necessarily sort of agree with. Uh, I wouldn't say it made me squirm, um, but you know, I, I'm I'm waiting to sort of you know have that that boundary pushed for me personally and see what happens. I mean, um, you know, I I would never profess that this is. Uh, I was gonna you know sort of say that that some of this can be very sticky, very messy. Um, it's you know it's dealing with uh, human relationships. 
uh, in, a, in a weird way, so it can get kind of intense. Um, I don't know that you know how exactly this, where this leads journalism, but I do believe that uh, collaboration is an important part. It will lead to some squeamish or squirmy moments, but I think that that we actually have to address those head on rather than, than stick our head in the sand. Do you have another point that I stopped you from making? No, it, it was it was really just to say you know uh, one thing that that I, I always talk about with collaboration. I don't know. I've talked about this with Josh Stearns from from Free Presses. You know, collaboration can sometimes be a buzzword, um, and, and I think it's really, and I, and I don't want to play it down and say, you know, that it's, it's not very powerful, but I think it's also important to recognize that there is a, a dark side of collaboration, which is a, it does take a lot of time. Um, it's not like you just sort of click your fingers and now all of a sudden you've got 50 extra people helping you out. Um, you know, there, there's an art to it, which is really an emerging art, so um, it's, it's, you know, something that we have to learn and share best practices so that we can continue to push it forward. It's a high touch. What? A high touch enterprise. It, exactly. It is. It's a very, I mean, you know, it's not something that you can sort of just do lightly. Uh, you have to be ready and committed to uh, spending certain amounts of time towards, again, communication. Uh, you can't do it without spending time communication. Um, you know, there's a little bit of diplomacy involved, uh, et cetera. And I think that's always an important thing to put out there when we talk about collaboration. It, it's not just a magic, you know, uh, rainbows and kittens won't fall from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> a little, um, little news organizations in small communities replicate this um, and, and do. Absolutely. I mean, I, I actually uh, point to Oakland Local as, as one of the best examples. Uh, in, in, and this is, of course, I'm talking about selfishly, it's about us. In total, they've invested about $700 in, in different stories and they've received about $8,000 worth of reporting back. Um, and that's just in terms of being transparent about the stories that they want to do and asking the public to sort of help enable them to do that. And that enables us to pay our writers closer to what they deserve because we, we grossly underpay them, which is not something we want to continue. So this is a way to be able to do more in-depth reporting at, at a better rate, and that's very important to us. And similar with, you know, uh, that's just, again, you sort of spot us model asking for money, but I think in terms of distributed reporting, that is something that, that small organizations can do, but they have to put in careful thought ahead of time. I have to say, since you provided the opening, that JLab is about to come out with a new ethics manual that uh, was um, written by Scott Rosenberg, the author of Media Bugs, uh, or of the Media Bugs site, that talks about all of these individual kind of squirmy, squishy spots that um, new media entrepreneurs are confronting um, that, that force them to make choices on the fly uh, and give some guidance on that. So that should be released probably in the next month or, or two. Um, okay, Tom, you wanna to talk about um, the New England Center for Investigative Reporting as well as um, some other stuff you're doing. You wanna come up here, you wanna, your choice. Yeah. If, if I just stand so that I can see everybody in the back, maybe that'll be fine. Uh, you know, when looking at uh, the spectrum of what is emerging in the last five or ten years or so, especially in the last five years, what uh, what we're doing in the New England Center for Investigative Reporting is probably would probably fall more toward the, uh, the, the traditional pole, the conventional pole of uh, of collaboration here. Uh, we probably all share the, the reason for us to even exist is uh, the, the, in many ways, the retreat of what we depended on the, in the legacy media to cover a lot of the news that I think people felt uh, and, and uh, is necessary for communities to, uh, to function, for democracy to function at, at really every level. And um, the genesis of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting uh, came because um, in, here in New England, uh, literally, uh, there there is only one full-time investigative news team now in all of New England, and it's at the Boston Globe, the Spotlight team. There are no longer our investigative reporting teams at any of the television stations in New England, as you would know, is one of the major markets. They'll do some things they call investigative reporting, which basically, uh, uh, is they got a report somewhere and they say our IT team got it, but it's not the kind of investigative reporting that uh, that that uh, we feel <coughs> defines it, the kind that could literally take months to develop, and in many cases uh, uh, you work for months and nothing does develop from it. It's it's literally hard work and it's uh, the kind of thing that often isn't productive uh, commercially. So so what happened was that. Uh, with the economic crunch as the business model shifted away from 
the traditional media, that was uh, investigative reporting was uh, one of the first things that, that uh, got locked off. So, um, uh, so uh, two really uh, veteran investigative reporters here in uh, the Boston market, Joe Bergantino, longtime investigative reporter for, for uh, ABC News and Channel 4, WBZ, which was one of the largest uh, uh, television stations here. Uh, he, he left WBZ, and uh, Maggie Mulvihill, another investigative reporter, she came primarily out of a, a newspaper background. They, uh, they came to me, I was newly arrived at Boston University, as Jan said, having come through a traditional newspaper background at uh, the Miami Herald. And uh, initially the discussion was, is there some way that, that uh, Boston University could support them essentially just providing office space and so forth. The more we talked about it, though, the more uh, I think both of us realized that this was, in many ways, an, uh, an opportunity for the university and I think also an obligation, um, or at least it was part of a response to what I think of as a university's obligation to support the, the community. So, um, so we, we came up with the model for what is now the New England Center for Investigative Reporting at Boston University. And it's, uh, uh, again, it's somewhat traditional. Universities have been engaged for quite a long time in having students usually uh, take on a project and uh, perhaps working, for instance, with uh, on capital punishment cases. Uh, Northwestern has done that to Paul. And, um, uh, and so that model had been in place. What we were going to do that was going to be a little different from that is we were establishing a full-time investigative reporting center, meaning that it was not um, the first obligation of Joe Bergantino and Maggie Mulvihill, the two directors of this, was not to actually teach students. Their first obligation was to be investigative reporters. And we would try to build around that uh, what would benefit the university. Clearly, we had uh, uh, our, our own interest was we wanted to take advantage of having the center here so that students could benefit. So the way we structured it was uh, the model was uh, somewhat along the lines that you think of at a, uh, at a medical school, at a university, where you have on the faculty of the medical school people who are, are physicians, practicing doctors, who are going about the work of, um, that doctors do, but a student in the medical school would be uh, at that physician's shoulder, learning by seeing what the physician was doing. And so, uh, so it accomplished both the role of the physician delivering hopefully healing and the, the uh, med student learning from it. So we thought this is a model we'll, we'll try. And in fact, that's the way it works now. We have uh, uh, students who are in our investigative reporting courses will actually be assigned to work with, the, with Maggie and Joe on stories. And it's gone beyond that where even after that course is finished, students for additional credit can continue to work on stories that they started and, uh, and extended longer than a semester. So, Rather than it just being a class project that begins and ends according to the academic calendar, what we do at the New England Center for Investigative Reporting is, is truly a 12-month-a-year, um, 24-7 kind of uh, investigative reporting operation. So what happens when students are around in the, aren't around in the summer? The work goes on, although we do have students who will stay on in the summer and work as interns through the summer, or they'll be involved in summer courses. But um, there's no time in which the center actually stops producing what it's, what it's producing. And one of the things that um, that uh, that I thought was uh, uh, would help in establishing this, or what, among the many things that a university can bring to this kind of reporting, that um, is probably unique in that we, there are just a number of assets that go with being a university. I mean, number number one. Uh, you do have a, a ready-made group of, uh, of people, namely students, who are eager to help. I mean, these are in many ways the foot soldiers. And in some cases, I think we're able in a university setting to bring more of those kind of resources to bear than you'd see even at um, some of the more traditional and larger uh, investigative reporting teams. And for instance, if we decide we wanted to do an in-depth look at how uh, 
uh, traffic arrests were being handled in a city over a period of time that entailed literally going through tens of thousands of records over the years, that would probably be more daunting to even the Boston Globe than they would want to take on. Be a lot, a lot of work for perhaps a little return. But that's, for us, it's the sort of thing we could take 20 students. It's somewhat like David said, a thousand pages and one page apiece. We can throw a lot of students at that and, uh, and they can come back with the information and of course uh, we can then pull all of that together and produce a story. So we have a lot of assets in terms of, uh, of people that we can uh, engage in. Also, universities are, um, are uh, they're places of knowledge. They really fonts of a lot of wisdom. We found we're able to rely, um, it's sort of crowdsourcing, but in a, in a special kind of a crowd. If we have need, for instance, for someone to explain or help us understand a complicated balance sheet for a corporation, we have a business school with faculty and with grad students who are uh, not only knowledgeable about that, but usually eager to get involved in something that they see as having a real payoff. So we have the business schools and law schools and faculty with the expertise in different ways. And of course, universities have terrific libraries in this day. Of course, libraries that go far beyond what uh, we may have thought of. We're not talking about books and magazines. We're talking about databases and uh, people who are incredibly skilled at searching information. So all of that is available, almost readily available for, uh, again, the investigative reporters to take advantage of and use. So, uh, and one other thing that we found uh, that it mattered a lot was the, the credibility of the university itself. Now, one of the things every reporter knows uh, is that when you're trying to get that, that difficult source to talk to you is uh, literally to get them to talk to you. How do you get somebody to answer your phone call or respond to an email? Or, you know, the first question they, they would always ask themselves is, why should I talk to you? Who are you? And uh, if you're a freelancer and you're struggling uh, with perhaps uh, the ability to get to somebody, that's a tough, tough challenge. Having the university behind you, or having the ability to say that I'm working with the New England Center for Investigative Reporting at Boston University in this community, that matters uh, a lot. Maybe people hadn't heard of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting, at least not when we started, but they know Boston University and they figure that if somebody connected with the university is involved in this, they probably have some some credibility, and um, and maybe they've even got some power so that if I don't talk to them, there could be consequences. It did matter a good bit. And uh, one of the things that we found once we got started is we became a place where other uh, freelance reporters came to because we provided a platform for them to do the kind of journalism that uh, they were capable of doing, but didn't really have an outlet. They didn't perhaps want to go with uh, go to the Boston Globe or uh, navigate those, but they could come work. Can you pay them? Uh, yes. Well, what we would do in those cases is we would use some of the grant money that, um, that we got to help to pay them. So they were paid. They didn't do this for nothing. And we found that um, we were able to get some very, very significant stories uh, in in, uh, through us that were then placed. So, oh, and, and I'm skipping over the big part. We don't um, see ourselves as original uh, sources, as original publishers uh, of, uh, of, of the news or the investigative reports that we do. We do see ourselves as a content provider for those organizations that are already capable of doing it. So we have partnerships with major news organizations throughout New England, the Boston Globe, of course, being the largest, but also uh, we had from, for quite a long while, we have New England Cable News. By the way, we deliver the, the uh, content that we do in any platform that our partners want. So again, another thing that the university brings is we have the ability to do television uh, reports. Of course, we can deliver it in a text format. We have a, a web partner, so we deliver things. Uh, so there's a web aspect of every story that we do, an online aspect of it, and, and even radio. One of our partners is 
probably a captive partner, it's the NPR station in Boston. The, the licensee is, is Boston University, WBUR, which, by the way, I think is the, the second or third largest uh, NPR station in the country. So they had tremendous assets and uh, they work with us. So having those partnerships, I think, is helpful. Um, in an interesting way, it also reduces the liability, something we had to worry about uh, that we share, because when we deliver the content to any of our partners and they use it, uh, clearly they have total control over the decision to publish or broadcast, and so they assume the liability for doing that, and then what we'll do back is, uh, is we will then key on our website, necir-du.org, by the way, which is up here, is uh, it keys to their, um, either their site, say at the Boston Globe, or if it appeared in NECN. That way, uh, we're, in, at least our lawyers tell us, uh, our liability for any of this is minimal, uh, should we get sued, and fortunately that hasn't happened. Do you lawyer all these stories? We lawyer process? all these stories. We do have a, a lawyer that initially started pro bono, but we now pay a um, embarrassingly small fee, for, but, but is the lawyer that we use to vet our stories initially, but of course the stories um, as delivered to our partners, they then will uh, vet them with their own legal staff as, as necessary. So we thought that, that, by the way, was an important consideration because the university wasn't about to put itself in a situation where it would be exposed to liability um, uh, at, uh, for anything that the center did. So dealing with the university has many, many ups. There are a few downsides, and it is that, that uh, universities are bureaucracies. People at Boston University say to be you, the first two words in bureaucracy are for you, the first two letters. So, uh, so we've learned that, and uh, could anybody pick up one of these stories so they have to pay for it? How would that work? Um, the uh, yes, we we <coughs> wouldn't allow anyone to pick up the stories for us as long as they would agree to uh, the there's a very basic contract. It would be as if you were a freelancer and you would go to somebody. You want to be held harmless, so first of all, so they would accept the liability. And we now have partnerships with oh. Um, a couple of dozen of the smaller news organizations throughout New England, uh, um, Brookline, Quincy, Lowell, Lawrence, uh, Worcester, Springfield, a lot of the smaller uh, cities. In and they don't have to pay anything? And they do pay. <laughs> Initially, for the first year, uh, we gave everything away because we wanted to establish uh, what we were doing. And uh, we have uh, now gotten to the point where we realize that is uh, uh, that's not possible. And let me just touch on this. I, I, I know I'm running over my time quickly. But for, uh, one of the things um, we would not have been able to go forward uh, were we not able to get a grant from the uh, Knight Foundation that it became our seed money. And uh, so we went to them with the proposal, um, many things I've talked about, why we felt a university-based investigative reporting center was worth their investing in and at least trying out. The, they were interested in it, but their uh, response from the very beginning is we're not going to get into the business of being the, the sustainer uh, with uh, uh, unending <coughs> obligation here. So, they agreed that they would fund us essentially for three years. And the idea would be with something on a glide path down where at the end of three years, and it's part of our grant, we, um, are, we are expected to show them, to demonstrate to them a, a, su a sustainable model for supporting this at a university. We've got about a year to go, and Lisa's on our, our board of advisors, by the way, so she can tell you this, is, this still remains the major challenge is how to replace the funding we're getting from Knight. Our budget annually is about three, about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and uh, of that, about two hundred fifty thousand comes from Knight in cash, and that uh, is critical because basically it, it uh, funds the the salaries and the kind of money you need to uh, go out and do it. Most of what BU contributes is infrastructure support for the center, of course, the students, and some travel and that kind of thing. 
but um, uh, so Does the EU take a cut of that money? Oh no, no. But uh, all of the the uh, what we've got to be able to do is find a replacement for the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars essentially in cash, and uh, we're. Uh, we were hopeful that we could do this by getting some other grants, which we've done, um, but most of those grants are for a year or two years, and most of them are relatively small. So, uh, so it's always a challenge to be updating them. We were hoping we would find that proverbial angel like ProPublica has, who would just give us a lot of money and say, go do good things. So far, we're still hunting for that angel. If you know, I want to let you know. Uh, but we we actually hoped that among our alumni base, another asset the universities bring, we would find that uh, that kind of a person, or we could set up something where alumni would give on a regular basis. That's proven to be more of a challenge than we thought. Maybe our alumni are a little stingier than we thought. Uh, but uh, but, but we'll point. continue to work on that. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's one of the problems. Journalism has one of the great fields of throwing off a lot of wealthy uh, people to nowadays. One so more we'll, question for me. Sure. How many stories would you think the center produces a year or a month or a few? We do. That's a great question. Uh, we, we produce every month one story. We guarantee, this goes back to that earlier question, we, we knew that if we were to uh, go to news organizations and say you need to pay us. We had to be able to guarantee them at least some stream of stories. So we've done that. We've started a probably call it the public eye project, and we guarantee our subscribers in this case at least one <coughs> investigative story a month, which we've been doing. And if you scroll through that on the website, you, you'll see uh, what we've done over the past year, and it is uh, this is. Really, this is good stuff. We this um, we've done some uh, investigative reports that have truly shaken things up. There's one we just wrote right by the uh, uh, sexual assaults on campus story, which we did, by the way, with uh, American University was part of that, and funding came from NPR. We did the New England piece of that, and. Uh, and it, uh, it caused significant uh, changes in policy at the University of Massachusetts and the uh, University of Vermont and some other places about the way they were dealing with uh, sexual assault reports on campus Tufts. It also, I have to tell you, caused a great deal of consternation among the top leadership at BU because we had the, the president of BU literally getting phone calls from fellow presidents at other universities saying, what the hell are you people doing? Why do you have reporters asking for our sexual assault records and that sort of thing? And um, uh, so, uh, but fortunately we have a president who said, well, if you're doing everything right, you have nothing to worry about. And that's the way uh, but uh, Arnie Duncan, the uh, uh, Secretary of Education was in New Hampshire a week ago, and he pointed to that story and the impact that it had uh, uh, on on uh, changing the way several universities operate with sexual assault. Um, so it's really some significant stuff. So thank you. Um, so the the one challenge that remains for us is to find that sustainable model. We're we're moving. <laughs> very heavily now toward one of the things we've learned, this was completely unexpected, is that the other asset that we have as a university is we're in the education business. And uh, so we have found that one thing that we can do to generate revenue is educate other people in uh, investigative reporting techniques. We started doing this with high school kids. Uh, last summer, and um, we just, on a whim, sent out flyers to high school students who were in the New England Scholastic Press Association, sense of the school newspaper editors, invited them to come to BU to spend two weeks in a summer camp for investigative reporting, charged them $600 each, just a day, and found ourselves with about $15,000 we never thought we would get. So naturally, this year we've doubled down and raised the price, and uh, we're getting in the back. We're doing a couple of those sessions. They now come and stay in dorms, and they pay a lot more. And uh, we think we found a business. We're also doing this now with uh, we're starting up a a uh, certificate program in investigative reporting for journalists or for people who would like to learn some basic skills. Bloggers, for instance, uh, who just 
feel, how do I how do I work the database? Where do I get databases and all that kind of thing? So we're doing that. We're, we're going to be running two sessions of that this summer. And most of the people who are coming to do this are from uh, overseas. We have people from Japan, China, um, uh, former Soviet countries coming in to learn investigative reporting techniques. So one of the things I think we're going to push very heavily in, in, into is investigative reporting uh, teaching as a, a revenue stream for us. So again, something that the university will so. Questions? So. Yes. Um, what percentage of your subscribing news organizations uh, contribute to your revenue? Well, right now, question? What, the question was what percentage of our revenue are coming to us from traditional news organizations? No, you're, you're subscribing news organizations. Smaller news oh, organizations. yeah. Uh, it would be right now the total about $40,000 of our annual budget now would come from them. So it's, uh, of the cash that we need, it's maybe 15%. And do you have any trouble finding these organizations that are looking for investigative journalism? And her question was, are we having trouble finding news organizations that are looking for investigative reporting? Absolutely not. And uh, I think that uh, that's probably because we've established ourselves. We have some credibility now, and so uh, they're no longer let's hold them at arm's length until they prove themselves. But also, um, sad to say, they're desperate for investigative reporting. If we can provide it, they're only too happy to get it. So, uh, over here. Back here. Um, you mentioned, you know, the funding challenges, and out there, you know, in the. Can everybody hear me? I got a mm -hmm. big mouth. So, um, what happens though? Is once the uh, here, once the students are done in this incubator, then what happens to them? Because obviously, there's lots of funding issues out there in the journalism world, not only in newspapers, but in other other entities in terms of, you know, finding the exact same thing, finding funding to sustain the model. So what happens, you know, it's great you're training them, it's, right. you know, terrific, but what happens to them? Where do they go after this? They, they are, they're getting good jobs. They're really getting good jobs. We have one of them uh, uh, who just is starting this week at the San Francisco Chronicle um, doing investigative reporting. The one is now at Politico in Washington, D.C., not doing investigative reporting, but as a reporter. Uh, so uh, this, uh, I think, is, they see having worked at the, the New England Center for Investigative Reporting as an important piece of the resume that they're developing and leaving college with. So, with NPR, global NPR, with the local news media, or where say, oh, hope we're going to add the other stuff Second part, and I think I've heard, kind of heard the answer to this, um, with the funding model that you're using for it, um, and creating a sustainable model, do you think it's going to be the educational aspects of it that create the sustainable model? Or do you think that the news aspects of it can create a sustainable model? Yeah. Um, uh, first question, we had explicit arrangements with uh, the partnerships. I mean, we, we literally sat down with our lawyer, sat down with their lawyer, and said, this is the agreement that we want to have going forward. So uh, so nothing was left to speculation there. And primarily, that was uh, for our, our, our liability concerns. And I'm sure they understood. Um, on, uh, I, my, my guess is, Lisa may have some thoughts on this too, and she's involved in it. But uh, my sense is that we're probably going to find that we're able to get more revenue from um, from the educational piece than we uh, are from actually selling our stuff. I think the, uh, the ability of news organizations to pay for content is really limited. Uh, and our ability to produce more of, of it is also limited. I mean, you, we don't want to make ourselves in uh, sort of a, a, a content mill because investigative reporting shouldn't be that way. Uh, so, um, so unless we literally expanded the number of people who are producing it, we couldn't, we wouldn't have more quote, product to sell. And I don't know that the market for buying it is going to grow much more than it does. And certainly, they're not going to feel they can pay a lot more. So, I see that uh, revenue source as being relatively capped 
uh, and uh, but the other, the other, the uh, educational side of it, I almost see as this can grow as much as uh, we would like. We just bring people. We have uh, other Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporters who come in and we pay. Uh, they work with us and they are involved in the teaching side of it. So uh, I think we can continue to draw. I know we have more questions, but I'd like to get Lisa in and then pick up more questions at the end so that we don't run out of time. Okay. Lisa. Yeah. I'm actually kind of. I drank too much coffee and I'm kind of a fidgeter. And I don't want you to have to see me sort of sitting there fidgeting in my seat. Uh, I'm tired of coffee. Uh, So my name is Lisa Williams, and I run Place Blogger, which is the largest searchable index of local web blogs. If you want to know who's blogging and come back to you, I got you covered. I think I'm the only person in the history of history who's actually ever tried to read all of these. And over the few years that I've been doing it, it's become more and more like a regular news source. It's become more like a newswire with way more catfish. And when we started, my, our office was my back porch, and I used to, these little stickers were like, lessons I learned painfully again and again, and I would write them on tape and put them up above my desk. But speaking of collaboration, we um, are, we're, uh, one of the benefits that we get is uh, we moved to this amazing co-working space in Cambridge that has 240 startups under one roof. Wow, it's really amazing. And um, I just want to say, this is a really great event, and I'm really happy to have you in Boston. I, I, I live here, and I want to welcome you here to the home of you know, uh, gay marriage and universal health care and the Red Sox thing. Um, <laughs> we love having you here. It's just great, you know? And uh, the other thing I do in my copious spare time is I also uh, work at the Media Lab on the future of news. This is my personal guide to the Media Lab. Right? So just in case you want to go over there and find the robotic cats. Um, and uh, so the thing I want to talk to you about today is that what I've found is that for, for journalism, the future is small. Okay, and that sounds bad, but I'm going to tell you why it's not bad. And it's also why collaboration is going to be so important. So when I say the future is small, what I really mean is that the future of journalism is about smaller and smaller organizations making a bigger and bigger impact. Okay, and the good news about it, and I, I spent a lot of time looking at this and being bummed out about it. This is a map of, new, of layoffs in newsrooms. That's 14,000. Okay, that's not cool. So basically shorter, not good. Right, and the, the good reason, the, the good thing about small is that when you're facing the ice, when you're facing the iceberg, the kayak is a lot safer than the Titanic. Okay, so, and I wrote an essay with this title a few years ago, and I still really believe it. I really believe that journalism will survive the death of its institutions, and that's because I, me and my family, we've been through this before. I actually don't have a lot of newsroom background. My entire family is sort of a high-tech family, right? In the 80s and early 90s, we went through what the news media is going through today, where we had a simultaneous giant crack up of all of our major institutions, where there was wave after wave after wave of layoffs. And it just looked really, really grim. Um, and, you know, we used to think, oh, well, it's all going to Japan or something like that. This was the late 80s. <coughs> and um, what really happened was that um, it became much easier to start a small company and it became much easier to make a big impact with something small. So we track over 7,000 local sites. Um, and the growth has been really kind of amazing. When we started looking in 2006, the number of Americans who lived in a city or town with a grassroots local independent news site that's not attached to a major media organization is only one in eight. Now it's one in two. That's faster growth than cable news. Okay. So, and the other thing I want to say that people bring up to me, well, I, I want to say small does not mean trivial. Okay, this is about a project called Ushahidi, which allows people to do um, sort of uh, instant reporting with cell phones. And there have been a lot of pilot projects with it in Africa. And it's allowing people to say, well, is this polling place a safe place if it's open? Okay, that's not trivial. Here in the United States, blogs like the, uh, the LA Homicide blog was started by a reporter who said, you know, the homicides have become so numerous that we're not even mentioning people's names in the newspaper anymore. 
And so this is a project that gives people a simple dig dignity of being recognized, of having their name put somewhere. You know, so independence. Um, grassroots local sites can do really great things. We have um, Susan Mernit here, and she talked to you a little bit about their coverage of the um, of the Oscar Grant trial, which I think was great. Now, this was a, a site that, at the time, you know, well, it started out as like for a while. Your when when you started, your your office was your your dining room table, right? Now you kind of like you've moved on to co-working space too, another collaborative aspect. But you collaborated with like tons of people to make that story work, right? It wasn't kind of a one. Um, organization thing. That's how it works now, right? Or a site like um, New Jersey Spotlight. This is a guy who, uh, a, a reporter who took a buyout from someplace. The first week he started his re website, he published a story about corruption at a public utility that's, that uh, triggered an attorney general investigation. So small doesn't have to be trivial. Now, why is that important, right? It's important in part because, you know, um, our problems are distributed and global, but our media historically is consolidated and local. It makes it hard to sort of um, cover big stories or hold the powerful to account. I'll give you an example. Like, for instance, you know, there are a lot of stories that are hard to trip to cover when you're like that. With global warming, what are you really going to do? Interview every penguin? You know, it's tough. <laughs> Unless you have a lot of collaboration and a lot of people in a lot of places, there are a lot of serious, important stories that are hard to cover. You know, uh, as an example, this is a picture from a really amazing package done by the Washington Post about the treatment of veterans at Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital. And they very deservedly want a Pulitzer for it. But when you don't have collaboration between lots and lots of people, I, it's something really frustrating, something that really frustrates me happens a lot, which is you always get some weasel behind a podium saying, this is just an isolated incident. <laughs> right? You need a lot of people, you need a lot of collaboration to fight back against. Okay, so that's all I have to say today, but thanks very much. And thanks for coming to Boston. Question. The question that's going to come up again and again, I think, and, and it's already come up to um, one of our other speakers. Okay, so I get that it's great to have all these local, small organizations, but people have to earn a living somehow. And how are, how are these um, small local organizations monetizing what they're doing? Or are they not? And it's something that people have to do in their spare time. So I, um, within the United States, we track about 4,100 local sites, right? Even if nine out of 10 of them went out of business and never became sustainable, that's still about 410 new independent media sources that make a living in a country that only has around 1,200 daily newspapers, that makes a big difference. So to a certain extent, it is a numbers game. There are a lot of people going into it. Some of the people I know who do it, do it as a passion project. Other people want to turn it into a business. I think that one of the things that happened in sort of the restructuring I talked about before in the tech industry is that it took a long time. Recovering from that giant crack up took almost a decade. And yes, a lot of people that I knew in that industry left the industry for good, became teachers, did something else for a while. Those kinds of like industry restructurings take a long time. And you know, as a group, what we can think about in terms of supporting an independent media or supporting collaboration, we have to think about what do smaller organizations need. Um, I'm a small organization, and I'm, I need a payroll. What I really need is easy access to healthcare for my employees. I need a place for us to be. I need legal help, right? So we got to think about, and some of those questions are political, right? So it matters how you vote. Um, so some, so I think that when we think about the restructuring and also when we think about like the smaller organizations, you have to ask yourself, what did the Boston Globe look like when it was two, right? And maybe, you know, cut the smaller organizations some slack and see them as being in a particular developmental state, right? And say, you know, it's like growing a plant. You can't yell at them and say, grow fast. Hmm. No, I didn't say that before, <laughs> but, but I agree with a lot of How do you make that into this idea? Yes, please. So, so, so I want to talk about I want to talk about a dirty little secret, which addresses your point, which is that um, making local media work really takes more than one entity. Um, if you want local media to work in your community, you have to support it. That means that as an individual, you have to decide how much money you're willing to donate to it, just like you would to public radio or public television. It also means if you're a larger entity, you have to decide how to partner 
we're about to become a partner with KQED in a project that will enable us to do a lot more investigative reporting, but I look with envy at people in other parts of the country where the journalism school or the local paper wants to work with them. I'm in the East Bay of California, and our local journalism school and our local paper turn me down every six months that I ask them. So if the people who should be your partners think that you, as tiny as you are on the competition, you need to crush, it's actually not a good climate to survive. One of the models where I think they're doing a wonderful job is in St. Louis with the Beacon, where they've done a wonderful job of really collaborating with a lot of institutions. We're starting to build that relationship with the city of Oakland, where the marketing department sees us as a way to market their festivals and their events, and that's been really helpful. But I don't necessarily see the kind of institutional support for Oakland Local that long term I think we need. And I think a lot of the places we have success, you look at Tom's example, where he's coming from a mainstream paper. Um, if you're not a mainstream organization, you don't get any support. You know, it shouldn't all be on the entity. It's not just my responsibility to make Oakland Local work. I need other groups to help me for us to survive long term. So I think you have to think about the idea of collaboration is also about shared accountability if you want something to work.